So I had mentioned that what I was going to be doing this year is once a week, I would be taking an email, reading it, kind of dissecting it and answering any questions. And hopefully my answers can help you to move past this difficult time. Okay, so let's jump into that letter. She wrote, hello, my name is Jen. I'm 41 and I've been in a toxic, possibly narcissistic relationship for six years. I've recently gone through my second discard after we had reconciled. It's like he watched a video or something and told me everything I needed to hear to entertain a reconcile after the hellish place I was left in the first time. After he left the first time, I didn't know what I had been through. I felt like I had just lived through a crisis or a nervous breakdown or lost my only real love I ever really knew in the intense way we had started. He wasn't always bad. He was mostly there for me. We saw each other regularly, friends with his friends and family even helped me through a horrible back problem and carried me to the loo for a week. He had a dark side, like he was two people in one body. And he loved to use my love for him as punishment because it hurt so badly that I usually caved or agreed, yet was still confused. After that first sudden discard, I had to take a short leave from work because I just couldn't function and was sobbing all day. A friend of mine asked me if I was still with him because she saw him on a dating site two days after he left. That broke my spirit even more, and I got sad and very angry, too. He left because I was so uncomfortable and felt emotionally unsafe with him as we were about to live together. As that time approached, things got so much worse. Accusations of being selfish and possessive, not about him, but of things I wasn't allowed to say I had possessions directly to him, like my car or my room. Everything had to be ours, not mine. He said I should be in this practice because we are soon to live together. This idea had me spinning. I was always independent and hadn't lived with a man since my daughter's father back in my early 20s, and I was 40 then. He told me I was not able to think badly about him or question him because I should deny myself and not be so selfish. Any issue, no matter how small I brought forward, always was placed back in my lap. And I was told if I didn't have a need or remorse, so think about it and feel bad about it, then we would have no problems because the root of that is focusing on myself. It was my darn selfishness. He was very calm, but self-righteous and very convincing that he loves me and that it's for the best for us. We were going to have a future. He could be kind and gentle, and at the same time, very firm and stubborn. He made me feel like I had some defect, that I couldn't understand his way of thinking. But then I assumed, because he said he loved me, and cared for me, and was there for me, what he was saying must be true. After I confessed and confronted him about feeling this way, and needing to get this cleared up before living together, he said, He's gone, and he went to bed and left at five in the morning while I slept. He came back three or four months later telling me how selfish he was, and he was doing this to me because he found it hard to change himself, and he used words like projection, that he projected his fears and inadequacy onto me and told me how wonderful I am, and he sees that, and he asked to be held accountable by me. I was shocked. I praised God. Well, trying to hold him accountable was impossible. Within months, he'd be slipping back to his old ways, and I'd bring it up, and he was very defensive. He told me I was negative, that he doesn't want to hear it, and I'm stuck in the past, and just says I have anger and, uh, and I haven't forgiven him. I was unforgiving and paranoid. I would get so frustrated in speaking to him, I'd at times shout to try to get through, but then I had anger issues on top of the negativity. I'd secretly record these times to listen to later because while in conversation, it was difficult to think clearly and see how he would manipulate. He pulled back physically, then emotionally, and it became stonewalling. Then I did all I could to make it right, even telling him I still cared and was committed to working this out. He agreed to changing and could understand my points, but left a week later after going silent for days. I was fooled by a wolf in sheep's clothing, but I find that I struggle to get anyone to understand how confused and unself-assured I am. I'm not even sure how to get that back, really. 
Even though after the first discard, I learned a little bit about this and read Psychopath Free in shock. When I talk about this experience, I hear, well, maybe he's not a bad guy. You just weren't right together. It feels way worse than that. I look for validation like a drug addict. I was wondering, how do we get past seeking someone else to validate how much this destroys us inside and how unsettling it is to be so close to a monster like this? In the end, I feel like he tells people I'm difficult, angry, and hard to love. As he said in one of our last arguments, when I brought up a hard feeling I had about the treatment I was receiving. It was always a mind-bending, exhausting experience. From what I remember, when a normal person shares a hard feeling, then you exchange apologies or thoughts. And at the end of the day, say, hey, I didn't mean that. And I love you. Or I can see that. I'll do my best not to do that anymore. Sorry if that hurt you. That's never my intention. These things never happened. It was a mental beatdown every time. I'm a little wiser coming out of this discard, but still very much hoodwinked and hurt. I wish I could move on just knowing I'm not crazy. This wasn't normal or right. This isn't how people end relationships. He ended it via text. After six years, I just need to know that my hurt and confusion is valid. How do we move past this feeling? Is it just time that heals all wounds? I'm afraid of men at this point. I'm afraid I'm too unsure of myself to put myself out there. I hope one day I can. Okay, so first, I just want to say I'm so sorry to hear what you went through. And I kind of want to pick it apart and hopefully help you to have this validation that you're seeking. But more importantly, in the end, I want to talk about how you can overcome the validation or the need for validation. And it's really nothing that comes from me or from anyone else. But we'll, we'll get to that. The first thing, I actually made a list of all the things that I saw just in this email, okay, that are major red flags. Whenever somebody is two people in one, that's a bad sign. I'm not saying that that's a, a sign that the person is definitely a narcissist, but that is a sign of unhealed wounds that that person isn't able to, to be whole and complete as who they really are. Now, not only in this case is he two people, but he's like a kind person and a horrible person is what it sounds like. So what begins to happen when you're in a relationship like that, kind, mean, kind, mean, that's intermittent love. That's intermittent love and hate, hot and cold. That does something to your brain that creates the trauma bond. It, it's a chemical cocktail that it creates in your brain, the hormones that push you to reconcile with this person. And then your brain rewards you when you are in those moments when he's kind, but then the person becomes evil again. And then the brain does something interesting. It sees that you're in pain when this person is mean. And what it does to help you is it deletes. So you think of your brain as having like this big whiteout right? So all these horrible times, delete, delete, delete. And then your brain focuses on, but he took me to the loo for a week, three months of abuse, but he took me to the loo for a week when my back was hurting. That's the brain's way of trying to keep you from feeling so much pain, but it keeps you stuck in that trauma bond. And in that trauma bond, everything gets confusing, which it sounds like you were noticing. There was a, an intense amount of confusion that was going on. So that's always a red flag. When you feel confused in your relationship, when you're like wondering things like, am I, am I allowed to be upset about things? Am I allowed to feel this? Anytime somebody says that and they're confused about their themselves, how they see themselves, that's a red flag that you're in a relationship with somebody that's manipulating you with gaslighting. They're confusing your reality to the point that you don't even recognize it yourself. You're starting to get dizzy by the way they're spinning everything. Okay. So something else you said, you said he, he used my love for him as punishment. Again, without labels and calling anyone, you know, saying, someone has a specific disorder, that's just emotional cruelty that somebody uses your love as punishment, right? If you don't do exactly what they say, 
they hurt you emotionally. That's emotional abuse. They're not putting their hands on you. I remember when I was learning what was emotional abuse, what constituted emotional abuse. And one thing, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I didn't realize this at the time, but one thing that I read that constituted emotional abuse was if somebody refuse, refuses to allow you to feel like you please them. Like no matter what you do, they're just unpleasable. That's somebody that is punishing you and abusing you emotionally. So I'm just pointing this out because a lot of the things that happen with a narcissist, because they don't make sense and because they aren't always done with like screaming and yelling or name calling, it can be confusing as to, is this really bad? Well, it is emotional and psychological abuse. Okay, so we have to start looking at what exactly constitutes abuse, including the covert things that narcissists do. The fourth thing that I wanted to point out, he left because you expressed that you weren't feeling safe. So if somebody leaves or breaks up with you because you express that you're not feeling safe, it can go down as something healthy or unhealthy. If it's a healthy relationship, then they say, a person would say, I don't want to make you feel that way. You know, I don't know why. Maybe we're just not good for each other. Maybe we're not bringing out the best in each other. I want you to be safe. And if it's, I'm not the one to, to you know, help you to do that, then it's best that we leave. Or they make you feel bad that you didn't feel safe. They make you feel shame that you actually express that you were uncomfortable by a certain treatment of theirs. Now that, that is psychological and emotional abuse. It's also causing you, it also causes you to question your own reality. And what happens, again, what happens is we start believing their words because you said, but he, he was so good at convincing me that he loved me. I imagine that a lot of the, or most of the convincing, I'm not saying that he didn't do anything nice, but I imagine most of the convincing was with words. And if you lined up all the things he said and all the actions he did, I'm gonna guess that they weren't on the same page, right? And again, one of the coping skills of our brain when it's deleting the negative and causing you to just look at the positive, because it does that, it gets really excited with the little nice things they do to the point, I kid you not, I remember in one relationship I was in and I was just like, no, but he's, you know, he does such awesome stuff. And then I stopped and I asked myself, well, okay, exactly what is awesome? And when I put them down, they were like these little things. Oh, he, he hung up my um, uh, holder for my jewelry. And I was acting like that was the hugest, most kindest thing that had ever been done for me. Well, it is pretty awesome when the alternative is abuse. And that's what we have to realize is that by that abuse and that kind little act, abuse, kind little act, what they're doing is training you to settle for the tiniest things they do as if they're amazing. Okay, so really looking at um, the words, a person's words and actions. Okay, you can't just listen to what a person says. You have to really make sure that their actions are on the same page. Here's something that really stood out to me. You said, I'm not allowed to think badly about him or question him. Wow. That's a person basically saying, um, you're not allowed to ever feel bad about anything I do. And all of my behavior is so perfect that you, you know, you're not allowed to say anything. If you do, you're being selfish. Think about that. Now I fell for that one too at one time. So don't, there's no shame in having fallen for these things. There's a lot to why we tend to fall for these relationships, but it's not about criticizing ourselves. Okay. We do at some point want to explore why, but that's, that would be for a whole nother video. Okay. 
Anyway, um, anyone that says you're not allowed and makes you feel bad and selfish for expecting better treatment, like expecting healthier behaviors from the other person is manipulating and controlling you. Okay, it doesn't always feel good when somebody points out something we're doing, but in a healthy relationship, the person is going to acknowledge their part and they're going to want to make you happy, right? Not demand that you be happy no matter what they do. That's an unhealthy relationship. So it sounds like there was a lot of future faking and he told you the things you wanted to hear. When we're craving certain things emotionally, we have certain needs and we all have needs, right? And we're craving them and somebody comes along and tells us exactly what we need to hear. It can be really tempting to trust it. But we, we have to make sure that that person's actions are on the same page. And this kind of goes into the next point that I wrote down that you said he had me convinced that I had a defect for not understanding his way of thinking. I will say this, narcissists are very, um, very good with words. They are expert manipulators. I remember one psychologist telling me, Michelle, a narcissist can convince you that the wall behind you is orange. And they can sound so convincing that by the end of the conversation, if you don't say, yes, it's orange, you'll probably find yourself saying something like, well, there must be something wrong with my eyes. There must be something wrong with me for not seeing it how they see it. So that's something very common. Also, you have to understand narcissists, they're always projecting, just like he said he was, right? Kind of told on himself a little bit um, when he, you guys were broken up. But narcissists will project what they see in themselves. So there is something wrong with him, right? And they will, because they see that, they will try to put that in their partner to the point that you start really believing there's something wrong with me. Then he hoovered, right? He became maybe a little educated. There's now, because all this information is out there for people that have been through narcissistic relationships, well, the information is available for them as well. And sadly, they can use that to manipulate in a more covert way. And it sounds like that's what he did. He told you all that you wanted to hear. Again, there were his words, hold me accountable. You're amazing. It's my fault. But the second you start believing it, everything flips again. And that's an abuse cycle. An abuse cycle is not bad all the time. That's what people start to have to start realizing because sometimes we don't want to recognize abuse because we're like, oh no, but there were good times. Well, that's what happens when you're on an abuse cycle. It's like going on a roller coaster and saying, no, but we're not always going downhill. Sometimes we're going uphill and sometimes we're flat. Well, yeah, that's a roller coaster. Well, the abuse cycle is full of high amazing and horrible lows. You can usually identify an abuse cycle when the second you start trusting them, like to the, to the minute that you let your walls down, if the behavior swings back to old behaviors, that's an abuse cycle. So what happens is you let your walls down, you begin trusting it, so they slip back into who they were. So what happens? They abuse, 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 your walls go back up. And then they enjoy future faking, lying, manipulating, and watching your walls come down so they can do it all over again. Then what it sounds like he did was he began to push you to react, right? Because if you're like, look, one and one is two, and you have the evidence in front of you and somebody's like, oh no, it's three, and you're still trying to get through to them, sometimes you can get exasperated and you can lose your cool. And they know that, and that's what they're trying to do. Unfortunately, what he was doing was pushing you outside the bounds of who you are. And then he was pointing the finger, which is a typical, typical um, behavior with somebody that's high on the scale. So just looking at those behaviors, just looking at those behaviors that you just mentioned, and I know that's not even the tip of the iceberg, right? But in those behaviors, there's a lot of covert manipulation. There's a lot of emotional and psychological abuse, okay? And it's confusing. It is 
100% confusing because you're trying to wrap it around those two personalities, but he did this nice thing, but he's also this person, but he said he loves me, but then he also said this and that. And that causes cognitive dissonance. And it's not easy to wrap your mind around the reality. So you have to be compassionate with yourself, okay? So something you said, and it kind of ties into one of your questions. You said, um, I struggle to get anyone to understand how confused and unself-assured I am, and I'm not sure if I can get that back. Okay, that's your goal, right? But when you were in the relationship, I'm gonna read what I wrote from, from the email. You said, I after he started stonewalling you again, after he claimed he wanted to be reformed and wanted your help, and then he went right back to it again, you said, I did all I could to make it right. I did, I took all responsibility to try to make it work. And yet throughout your email, I could hear little signs of your inner self saying, this isn't good for me. Like when you were freaking out, when he was saying, don't do this, or when you were confused and all these red flags, they were going off in you. But what happens is when we've been through narcissistic abuse, they train you to only be allowed to have your feelings and your thoughts if they agree with you. And so that creates that thirst, that creates that need for validation. And it also creates a lack of feeling self-assured, a lack of um, feeling connected to self. In order to be connected to self, we have to listen to ourselves, which means when, so, when something inside says, this doesn't feel right, we have to pay attention to that emotion. If we've been through narcissistic abuse, we try to get the other person to understand why we're feeling that way, to change so that we don't feel that what, what's going on inside. But if you're with somebody that's high on the scale, they're not going to do that. They're going to further spin you until you lose all touch with yourself. So to get self-assured it's about checking in with yourself and honoring your feelings so if you're feeling what am i feeling i'm feeling disrespected instead of convincing them that they're being disrespectful if you're with somebody that refuses to see reality and your reality okay you have to validate your reality and say something like i see that th this is respectful and he can say oh you're just being selfish you're just this and that Rather than defending, whenever we start trying to explain and defend to a toxic person, we lose touch with ourselves. So those are the moments where we just have to say, well, that's your opinion. This is disrespectful. I'm ending this conversation. Now, I know that that sounds like it could be hard, and in the beginning it is, because it's a new way of handling relationships. Somewhere along the way, we were taught if we were in those kinds of relationships and tolerating those things, and I put myself in that category too, okay? If we were doing that, somewhere along the way, we were taught that we needed somebody else outside of self to validate us and to agree with us in order for us to be able to hold on to our reality. Now, all of us at one time in our life were like that in childhood. Right? We need somebody outside of self. We deserve someone outside of self to validate. No child can validate themselves. So if we're in a relationship that's waking up this need that I need someone outside of myself to validate me, it's probably because there's a wound of not being validated, of not being allowed to be your authentic self, to respect and honor what comes up inside of you that's been touched on. And so when a wound has been touched on, it kind of shows up in our life with the mentality of the age in which it was first inflicted. So if in childhood, we were not validated, and now in adulthood, we had a relationship that woke it up, right? That woke up how painful it is to not be validated. That wound is going to seek it in the way a child does. A child can't validate self, so a child seeks it from outside of self. And that's why after narcissistic abuse, 
we tend to try to get somebody to validate us because we don't know how to do it ourselves. We weren't taught in childhood. First of all, whenever we're trying to get somebody that doesn't understand narcissistic abuse to validate us, it won't happen. It, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's too confusing. And think about it. It's confusing for you and you've been through it. Imagine explaining it to somebody that has never been through it. Okay, so seeking it from someone that doesn't understand narcissistic abuse, you're setting yourself up to be hurt. Okay, and you just have to recognize that they are allowed to not understand how painful it was for you. That doesn't mean that it wasn't painful. They are allowed to not um, validate your experience and realize just how horrible that person was and how damaging it was. It'd be nice if they did, but they're, you can't control that. And you're still allowed to acknowledge that it was horrifying and devastating to you from the inside out. In other words, you don't need their approval. You don't need them to see it the same way as you for you to say, wow, this was horrible. This almost destroyed me. This was so painful. This changed me from the inside out. So just to reiterate, right, the way that you stop seeking someone else to validate you, how destroyed you are or were or still are, you have to start validating yourself and saying you have to learn or strengthen. I'll, I'll say strengthen because we all have the ability. It's just it's like a muscle that we've never used. OK, we have to strengthen the validation muscle, what it's like to use your adult mind, your logical mind to validate the emotional um, child wounds that are showing up. Okay, and that's something, it's a skill, it's, it's an exercise that takes a little bit of practice. But I will say this, you asked if time heals all wounds, it doesn't. If you don't learn this skill of using your adult mind to validate your child mind, years can go by. And I'm not trying to say this to put any fear in anybody. I just want to be as realistic as possible. Years can go by and you can stay stuck exactly feeling how you're feeling now. Time isn't going to take it away because the relationship conditioned you to have certain thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. If you don't change them, you can stay stuck in that emotional state that you're feeling right now, which doesn't feel good. Okay, and the belief is I need someone else to validate me in order for me to hold on to my truth. That's one of the beliefs anyway. And the last thing I wanted to address, you said, I need to know my hurt and confusion is valid. How do we move past this feeling? I'm afraid I'm too unsure of myself to get myself out there again. So just want to encourage you that in order to feel assured, and again, I probably said this earlier, but again, just repetition for, for emphasis. Um, the more you trust yourself now, okay? Narcissistic abuse separates you from you. Instead of asking, is this okay inside? Am I okay? How do I feel? What do I need? We separate from ourselves and we ask the narcissist, is this okay? How, you know, I feel this, is that normal? And we're asking them instead of checking in with self. So to get that self-assurance back, we have to start reconnecting with our inner self again and trusting what comes up. So it takes a little bit of time, but I encourage you to, to do the inner work, to explore the beliefs that that relationship caused you to believe about yourself and healing has to do with changing those beliefs on the inside. When you change that on the inside, the external will follow. We do this inner work together in the Thriver School of Transformation. This month, we are learning about how to get, our, how to get in control of our state, our emotional state, right? We can't work through a relationship if we can't control our body and our fight or flight and our trauma responses. Next month is about uprooting the beliefs that toxic people cause you to believe about yourself so that you can get back to you. So the school enrollment is closed at the moment. I am going to open it maybe February, the first four or five days. 
for anyone that wants to jump on for that month. I encourage anyone that is struggling to see who they really are to come join us for the month. We have about nine to 12 meetings every month. It's $79.99. We also do breath work and we do EFT sessions. So we add the cognitive and the somatic together on our recovery process. So Jennifer, I hope this helps. Anyone watching this video, please feel free to give her some validation underneath. But I will say this, Jennifer, no matter how much external validation someone gives you, the need for it will not go away until you can give it to yourself. Quick example, okay? Let's say I'm hungry. I'm really hungry. And every time I'm hungry, I try to get somebody else to cook for me, <laughs> okay? I'm just laughing, thinking of doing this to my kids. And so they cook for me and it feels good because now I'm not hungry anymore, but I will constantly need somebody else to feed me so that I don't feel that hunger. Well, validation is the same. I can give it to you now. People can comment below but the, the way to fill it doesn't go away with somebody else's validation. It goes away when you have strengthened that muscle to be able to do it for yourself. Jennifer, thank you for being the first person to send me an email. Uh, I hope this helped. This is something I'm doing for those that can't afford one-on-one -on -one coaching, for those that can't afford the monthly membership, which by the way is $79.99. I'm now doing video responses to emails, okay? So if you have a question, that you need answered and you can't seem to find a video to give you a specific about what you're going through, email me at nar.coaching at gmail.com and I will try to do one video response a week.